so much I forgot that I'm up, so you may be seated. We're going to begin this morning from uh, with two readings, um, one from Jeremiah and then another one from Luke. You know, with Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, Truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy 
and to overthrow, to build, and to plant. Now I'm going to ask you to stand for the gospel reading, which is taken from Luke chapter 4, verses 21 to 30. Then he, Jesus, began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were, were amazed at his gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here in your hometown the things that we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet, prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Pray with me now, if you will. And now, God, I ask that either through me or in spite of me, that you would speak to these, your people. Amen. I don't know if you have noticed, but we've kind of been on a bit of a tear lately. Now, when I, when I say a bit of a tear, I don't mean like Smith and Ember and I have been up here and just, just hammering y'all. Just that, That's not what I'm talking about. It's, it, in fact, it doesn't even seem to be anything spiritual at all that I'm talking about. What we've been on a tear about is that we've been literally tearing buildings down. Okay? Now, I don't know about you. I don't know what you remember, but our northeast side of the block that we have here used to look very differently when I got here. In fact, there were three buildings there, and they have been systematically torn down. The first was the coffee house, as it was known. There are other names that it's been given. It was on the corner. It was the one that we went in kind of before getting ready to sell stuff in there. We went upstairs, and there was a bit of a smell. It was actually a lot of a smell because there was something dead up. There. Anyhow, it was terrible. Um, but it had some amazing doors and th things, and there was a coffee deal in there that was unreal. And we still have the ice machine that was because it's like not sonic ice, but it's pretty close. So we, we have that. But, but then it was torn down. And then you might remember that the other kind of closer in, there was a green two-story house, actually had a plaque on it talking about how old it was, and it was old, and it, it, was, ter it, was, it was old, and it was, it was, it was the Lily Parsonage, and, and when they decided they were going to, to have their own place and, and be someplace else, well, it wasn't long after that it was torn down. And then we had nothing left there but the three-story apartment building. And I know that some of you were really attached to that building. <laughs> I don't know what your fond memories were, but you apparently, some people had some, and that's okay. Not everybody liked this. But the other day, it was voted on to tear that building down. And, and we thought it was going to be like next month sometime. 
And I came back from lunch, and, and somebody said, they're tearing the building down. And I said, I must get my camera. And so I went and grabbed my camera and, and went out and just, they were, I mean, they were already about two-thirds or half done. And we can keep, go, go to the next one. So we're there. And I mean, this, this dude's just going to town. That has to be like one of the most fun jobs on earth. I mean, let's keep going, Kate. Okay? And it, and it was uh, one of those, he's just, he's just, oh man, look at that big cloth. It's just, it's, you know, it's, and we'll keep going to the next one. And, and my boys, I think they could have stood there all day if I'd have let them. Just watching the destruction that was taking place. Let's go to the next one. And, it, and he's just, it's, and, and we'll go to the next one. And I don't know if you can see this, but do you see the, the kind of violet-colored hearth wall thing that was over a fireplace? Y'all, when this place was put up for sale a couple of years ago, Smith and I had the opportunity to go and walk through it. I don't know whether we were supposed to or not, but, you know, we had connections, so we did. Um, and that place was a trip. I, and I mean, a sh it was a strange trip. I mean, it, it's, it, I've told people the inside of it looked like where you would film a really bad 60s acid film. I don't know. It's just, it was... It was unreal. But there was a whole room that was painted this kind of pink-violet color, and it, it, was, it was something. Okay, we'll go to the next one. And it's coming down. The, the violet room is no more. And so it's, it's these things. That, I mean, I literally, we'll go to the next one. And what do we have? We've got a photographer Another photographer. This guy's actually a professional from the paper. So, so y'all saw the pictures in the paper. Um, and so we're, we're tearing it down. And what's going to go in its place? Let's go to the next one. Grass. Sod. Dirt. That's the whole side of the block right there. You can go to the, the final one. Uh, the whole side is there, and it's just now, it's just a grass field. That's all it is. And it seems kind of silly in a lot of ways. You, you have these buildings, they were there. I had somebody ask me, well, couldn't we have done this, or couldn't we have done that? And, and it's a great question, because you, you wonder, isn't there some value that's already there? And I can tell you from my perspective, having been in all three structures, that the value was there was removed. Some of the furnishings and some of the, 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 the pocket doors that were in some of the buildings were pretty amazing. The, the value that was there, we removed. Now, it, it could certainly be argued that there was more wood that could be saved. One of my many jobs before answering the call to ministry was I worked on a remodeling crew for a couple of years, and it's what we did. We went into places, and, and somebody says, okay, I have a room here, and I want it to be, like, much bigger. Or here's my kitchen, and it's fine, except for it was last, you know, redone in the 1970s, and I'm sorry, but that color green just doesn't work for me anymore though it's coming back. So, I mean, what do you do with that? I don't know. But, and, and so there's a change that needs to take place. And what we would do is we would try and save what we could save, whether it be a wall or whether it be fixtures or cabinets or whatever, if it was something that they wanted to keep or if it was something we thought, hey, we could use this on another job someplace else, we would try and save that. I mean, you've seen this happen. You, I mean, for, for many of you, in fact, you've binged watched this whole process. The other day for Katie's birthday, we, we made a trip to Laurel, Mississippi. Now, there was a period in time when I don't know many people that weren't actually from Laurel, Mississippi, that would say that for my birthday, I want to go to Laurel, Mississippi. But nowadays, people do because of two words, you can say it with me, hometown, right? Ben and Aaron Napier, this, this lovely couple that go, are going through Laurel and they're renovating it, you know, they're one house at a time kind of thing. 
And we went, and it was awesome. And what was really awesome was Pearl's Diner. Because, y'all, that is some legit fried chicken. I mean, totally. There was nothing on the menu that I had that wasn't some of the best southern food I have ever had in my life. And that's saying a lot because I've had a lot. But it was great. It was, it was a great experience. But you know from watching these shows, whether it's hometown or whatever, you name it. I remember my Extreme Makeover Home Edition from like 20 years ago. Um, you know, it's got all, we've been doing this for a long time, but you know that one of the big things is demo day. You've got to get rid of the things that are in the way of the new thing. Sometimes it's getting rid of the whole building. Sometimes it's getting rid of the whole structure and just starting from literally ground level and then, and then building back up. Sometimes it's just taking away the things that are, uh, uh, and, uh, they inhibit growth or inhibit the vision and pulling those things out of the way or moving them someplace else so the vision that the master, creator, whoever it is, will be put in place. So we've got this raise thing. It has to be raised, not R-A-I-S-E-D, but R-A-Z-E-D. It's got to be raised. It's got to be taken to the ground. And then something else can happen. This is what the, the prophet Jeremiah, what he was called to, what God said to him that you're going to do, it's really not a pleasant thing that he's called to do. In fact, if we went back and, and look at these verses of Scripture, we'll see that he's given this command, and it, it's, you know, I'm going to send you... Um, and I'm going to appoint you over nations and kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow. Nations and kingdoms. You, Jeremiah, this is, this is what your call is. That you're going to take and destroy things. You've got two lines of that, and then just a little bit, you know, to build and to plant. But the focus, the, the weight is put on that tearing things down. It's no wonder Jeremiah's going, hey, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. Have you ever had something that somebody has, has asked you to do, and you thought, I don't know if I'm cut out for this? And, and whether we could name it that or not, you engaged in some imposter syndrome activity and just, you know, you, that, that old cliche, fake it till you make it kind of thing. That's, I mean, that's just kind of what you had to do. Um, but and, and the truth of the matter is, oftentimes, the reason why we're asked to do something is because somebody sees something in us that says, no, actually, this person would be great for this. I, I see in this person something, but we don't see that. Jeremiah goes, I can't do this. What are you kidding me? But yet this is what God's call to him is to do. You're going to tear stuff down. You're going to raise things. And then after you've done that, then you're going to build and you're going to plant. I mean, it's no wonder. I'd have been kind of freaked out by that too. But it says that the Lord, it's the Lord who says that I am going to do this thing in you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I anointed you a prophet to the nations. Many of you have heard me said this, say this before, but Moses, you know, Moses was this also reluctant prophet. Moses was like, Lord, I can't do that. I, I can't go to Pharaoh. I mean, I can't even go to my own people, and I, I can't show my face anywhere. But yet, if there was one person who was uniquely prepared to do what Moses did, it was Moses. Remember, again, I know I've, I'm a broken record on this, but Moses, who Pharaoh says, hey, I never want to see you again. And then, boop, there's Moses back in, in Pharaoh's court. And you go, how did he do that? Is he just some sort of magician? 
Remember, he grew up in Pharaoh's court. He grew up as a child, a grandchild of Pharaoh. What do you do as a child in a big building? You play hide and seek. You learn all the corridors. You know how to get everywhere in that building. And so Moses is uniquely prepared. Look, this is a bit of a stretch, but just go with me on this. He is prepared to be the person to lead the children of Israel out of captivity because he played hide and seek in Pharaoh's court. I know it's a bit of a stretch, but there are other ways that God had gifted him and prepared him, but there's a practical thing right there. Who else is going to do it? Jeremiah, don't say, I'm just a boy. I see things in you that other people don't see that you can't see yourself. And then if we move forward and we come to Jesus, we need to remember where Jesus is in this scene. It, in this span of just a, a very short time in the, in the span of this part of Luke, Jesus has been baptized by John. He's gone into the wilderness and been tempted by Hasatan, the accuser. And then he's gone to Galilee, and he's starting there. It says, Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. So you go from this baptized in the Jordan, Spirit descend on him, this is my son, the beloved in whom I'm well pleased, goes out, faces the temptations of the devil, and then comes back to Galilee, goes around teaching, and everybody's like, oh my word, this guy's amazing. He's unreal. I had a call from a friend um, on Saturday, and I was, I was talking to him, and he was telling me about uh, a pastor who had gone and, and, and was preaching at this youth camp. He was like, you know, I know this guy's dad, and his dad's a pastor, and his dad's really good, but I could not believe how good he was. I couldn't believe how good he connected with the kids. I couldn't believe his, it was just so good. Do you, do you hear it? Because I know where he came from. How could, but, you know, his dad's actually really, really good, so maybe the son's even better. I mean, there, there's something there that, I couldn't believe that, but yet he was. And people are hearing this report about Jesus and going, this is unreal. So he came to Nazareth. Remember Nazareth where he'd been brought up? He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, or if you're English, Isaiah, was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's nice. He rolls up the scroll, gives it to the attendant, sits down. I don't know, is that like Jesus' version of a, a mic drop? He's just, boom, he said it, and then, boop, sit down. It, okay. And everyone in the synagogue was staring at him. You uncomfortable yet? Everybody in the synagogue is staring at him. So he goes on. And, you know, what would you say? I mean, you, I would expect you to get up and then maybe say something about the passage and make them feel good or do I don't, I don't know. But he just says, today this scripture has been fulfilled 
in your hearing. I think everybody was a little confused, but it says all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. And they, they said, is not this Joseph's son? Now let's stop there just a second. They're amazed at him. Jesus was not one who was brought up to go into the synagogues and to read scrolls. The Jews had a very specific school of training for that. If you were going to be a rabbi, you went through this specific school. And you would have been taught, among other things, to be able to read. And you would have been expected to continue hearing and listening and sitting at the rabbi's feet so that you too one day could become a rabbi. Jesus has been building houses. Or doing whatever stonemasons do, building houses. He's, he's been doing construction. And now he is, they're looking at him going, how did, how did he do that? Isn't this Joseph's kid? His dad's in construction. He doesn't, he shouldn't even know how to read. It was something else there, too. Isn't this Joseph's kid? Because there's a little bit of condescension there. There's a little bit of, well, we're not really sure about his past. We know where he came from. Y'all might get tired of hearing me talk about, you know, uh, coming out of a seminary and the DS saying to me, hey, where, where would you like to go? Which is kind of a silly thing for a DS to ask because... They're going to send me wherever they want. It doesn't matter what I say. But I just said, anywhere but Brandon. Okay? Now, y'all have nothing against Brandon, Mississippi. It's a great place. But it's my hometown. And it's not even so much that I'm concerned about, you know, being sent to my home church, even though that has its own little bit of, you know, okay, they're going to be nice and sweet. Well, isn't that great? But the second things get challenging, they're going to be, wait, 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 wait. We, we know you. We know your mama and we know your daddy. Not only that, we know the rebellious teenager that you were, you little heathen, and who you're going to come preach to us. I mean, there's a little bit of that, you know, that you're just kind of a little bit of afraid. That's really not why I said anywhere but Brandon. It's called ex-girlfriends. I'm just saying, that would have been weird. That would have been totally weird to be your ex-girlfriend's Preacher thing. Anyhow, so, so Jesus, hey, we know this guy. We know, I mean, this is kind of odd. And it would be one thing if Jesus had stopped there. But Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus said, he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, and this is where he gets into trouble, the truth is there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah. When the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath and Sidon. In other words, there were widows in Israel, but who Elijah was sent to was a widow in the land of the enemy. I mean, whoever that enemy is, that's where Elijah went. Why, why is he saying that? There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. 
Naaman the Syrian was a commander in the Syrian army who were actively oppressing and working against Israel. You, you hear this? Jesus is saying, no, the people that I'm going to is like those prophets who healed only who you think were the enemies. Well, and who in some ways for sure were. And that's where the healing took place. And now they're mad. They are mad. And they're not just a little mad. <laughs> They're very, very mad. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. Now, I'm not Smith Lilly, but I do have a picture that Smith Lilly took where he went to this cliff. Um, I've never been to, the, the, uh, to Israel, but... Here we have, here's the cliff. This is where they brought him to throw him off. There's a, a little plaque. I didn't, I didn't take a picture of it, but it, uh, Smith did, but I didn't, I didn't put it up. But there's a little plaque, and it talks about how they drove Jesus here, and he jumped off and when he was fleeting away. Yeah, no. That's not what it says. They drove him here to throw him off. And he walked through them and went on his way. Now, real quick, let's, let's back up just a little bit. Because didn't Satan take Jesus to a high place and say, Hey, why don't you jump down from here and all the angels will come, and you won't dash a foot. And look, everybody will worship you because the angels came and rescued you. And he said, no. And you know, I, I, don't, uh, I, don't, I don't know where exactly you know, your mind goes when it says, and, and they, you know, you'll say to me, doctor, cure yourself, and you, you think, okay, did that actually happen? Well... I don't know, but I, I do know that when he was crucified, people said, hey, he saved others. Let's see if he can save himself. There's so many parallels going on in this story. But what I want us to hear is that Here he is, and he's facing all this stuff, but he's not facing it by himself. We've been, we started the year with this series, Start with the Spirit. That as we begin 2022, we want to, we want to say, Holy Spirit, come and, and do a work in us. We recognize the brokenness that is all around us, and yet, we feel powerless to do anything about it. I mean, it, it just feels like we're just, uh, we're just chipping away at something that's, all the chipping we're doing, it's not going to change. We, we recognize that there's brokenness in, our, in ourselves, and we're, we're asking the Spirit to come and to, to bring about healing and transformation in our, in our broken places um, where we are individually. And we recognize that there's division even within our church. Whether we're talking about the United Methodist Church as a whole or even within Tupelo First UMC that there, there's places that, that we there come to and, and we don't agree. And so we're asking the Holy Spirit to come and to, and to help us to give us that what we need to be able to walk together not knowing how. And we feel like Jeremiah sometimes and go, I'm, I'm just, a, I don't know what to do. I'm just a boy. How can I, how can I help? And, and look, you might think that, um, you, you probably don't think that your pastors have all the answers, but you might think that, you might be tempted to think that, and it's not true. 
there, there are certain things that we don't really know for sure how we're going to manage this either. Now, we're going to move forward and we're going to this, but it's, it's, it's terrifying sometimes and we wonder how. Jesus is beginning this ministry, what we call his earthly ministry, but he's not going by himself. He's only begun this after the Spirit comes and indwells him. He recognizes his need and he, God fills that need. And in that, he has the strength to go and look on my own or on his own or on your own. We can do some things, but we're not always going to do God's things. We can get somewhere, but we might not have the vision and the wisdom to go where it is that God is wanting us to go. We'll just be somewhere. Like, we'll be someplace, but not God's place. I mean, that's what we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And how is that going to happen? Well, it's only going to happen if the Spirit is leading us and guiding us. And I don't have the strength to do it or the wisdom or the knowledge. I don't have that on my own. But yet, by the Spirit... With the Spirit, then yes, <laughs> then yes, yes, we do. The other thing is that there's resistance that we face, it's kind of interesting to me that Jesus goes from this place of acceptance, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased, to an utter rejection of that, if you are the son of God. And I, and I think, wow, there are so many times where I'm thinking, if God is with me, then maybe. And yet the Spirit comes along and says, no, there's no if. God is with us. God is with you. Whatever it is that we're facing, there are these things that they are overwhelming. You think about what Jesus faced in that early place, and it's like, if you are the Son of God, no, <laughs> I am. That's Jesus' statement. Before Moses was, I am. It's one thing when it's an outside force. You might think, well, I can face an outside force and I can say no to an outside force, but it's those inside forces. And I'm not talking about these internal voices, though. That's a real thing, too, at least for me. Um, but it, it's also, well, it's my in crowd. It's the people that know me, the people I grew up with. Well, isn't this Joseph's son? And if, well, in order to face those and to stay on the path that God is leading us, we can't do it alone. We have to have the Spirit of God present with us. One last thing. It's interesting to me that, yeah, Jeremiah is told he's going to build. And building is something we kind of get, you know, we can... I can lay out of forms and pour foundation and, you know, lace, put out some walls and build a roof and put on shingles and blah, 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 blah. We can, yeah, we can figure that out. But planting is something totally different. Planting is something that there's limited control over. I, I don't know. I, I just, I know how many plants I've killed to know that I have limited control over this. And there's also a waiting factor and I can't see it taking place. So there is a need also, and this is also where we need the Spirit's presence because we are sometimes just going to have to wait. Trusting, knowing that underneath the ground, 
in a process that, that we only see kind of after the fact, that God is working and moving. And he's empowering us to be the church. Let's pray. O oh, come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and move in this place. Lord, we're grateful that you already are moving. You already are working on our hearts and on our minds. And we ask again, come, Holy Spirit, and move in my life. And move in my heart. Oh God, as we come to you now and as we enter this time of prayer, speak to us and remind us who we are and whose we are. That you formed us together in our mother's womb and knew who we are. And knew then the calling that you have on our lives. God, remind us that you are with us. Holy Spirit, indwell us and accomplish your purposes. Church, I want to give you the opportunity now, if you'd like, to go to the kneelers, if you'd, if you'd like to go and pray. And ask the Spirit to come and indwell and empower you. Because the journey that we have ahead of us is not always going to be easy. In fact, it's not going to be easy. But remember that God is with us. Trust that there are things that might be torn down and it might be painful, but trust that there will be a planting, a building, a renewing, a restoration, and what is to come is better than what was before. Why don't you respond now as God is leading?
Oh God, we are grateful that we are not alone, that we are yours and you are present with us. Oh God, you've called us as your church to be agents in your world. And so we come now and we bring to you ourselves. We bring to you ourselves to be used according to your purposes. And God, we bring to you our tithes and our offerings that you would work and move in and through our church. And, oh God, we acknowledge as your disciples that we need you. And so we pray together this prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Thank you. 
stand together and receive now the benediction. As the redeemed children of God, go in the power of the Spirit, recognizing that God is with you, recognizing that the brokenness of the past is being restored and made new, that you are being built up, that within you is planted the seed of the Spirit who is making all things new. In that power and in that strength, go now and be the church. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.